Okay, so let's start this um, lightning talk session, um, session B of the, the last day of Open Science Fair. Uh, okay, with this introduction, maybe more people will join, which is which is great. So um, this uh, this light, in this lightning lightning talk session, we have six presentations uh, for one hour, seven minutes uh, per presentation, a bit more. Uh, I think uh, what is important is to have some interactivity. Okay. At the end, we will have a few minutes for questions and for final remarks from the presenters. So let's use the chat. If you want to ask questions, you can ask questions in the chat and the presenters can, can reply and give, uh, uh, and give and provide some links, useful links about their presentation. So let's use the chat to enrich the, the presentation. So you can ask questions in the chat and the presenters can give some more input there, links, etc. But at the end, we'll try to have some time for two or three questions. Um, this is this this uh, session is being recorded. Will be made available in the in the Open Science uh, Fair website and also in the YouTube channel of the conference. Um, and uh, please make some noise uh, about this session in the in social media, in Twitter, Facebook, etc., using the hashtag OSFair 2021, and mentioning also the the OSFair the uh, OSFair uh, Twitter account. Um, let's start. Uh, so we have six presentations, um, uh, relevant initiatives, different projects, the developments, which is great. So I think we have a really a rich session here, um, uh, from mainly from uh, from uh, Europe, but we also have contributions outside of Europe, which is which is great. So let's start to, with Rafael Tournoy. Uh, presenting Episciences, uh, publishing in uh, Diamond Open Access with overlay journals. So, um, Rafael, uh, the floor is yours. You can start. If you have questions to Rafael, just put it in the chat during their presentation or at the end. And Rafael for sure will reply. Um, okay. Okay. Perfect. Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. Okay, let's go. So I'm Raphael Tournoi from CCSD. CCSD is a French research unit based in France. So uh, our mission is to provide tools in the respect of open access principles for archiving and the dissemination of scientific publication and data. CCSD is operating three interconnected platforms, AL, an open access repository, ScienceCon for organizing conferences, and EpiSciences for publishing open access journals. So about Epi Sciences, it is a platform to publish open access scientific journals. At the moment, we are hosting many journals from mathematics and informatics, but we can host uh, also uh, journals from any disciplines. And um, we are, it is possible also to welcome new or flipping journals. For instance, we have journals that were previously hosted as open access journals or others that were previously based on commercial publishers. It is a service designed by and for scientific communities because it has been uh, designed by the principal by a mathematician, Jean-Pierre de Mailly. Uh, we are publishing in Diamond Open Access. It is free to access and free to publish without IPCs. And in fact, it is a mix of gold open access because our journals are available, in, of course, in open access and of green open access because all the safe archiving is done in the open access repositories. At the moment, it is part of the OpenR catalog, and it is soon coming to the EOS catalog. Uh, so the special thing about EpiSciences is that it's an overlay journal model because we're operating on top of open access repositories like AL, Archive, and Zenodo. We can add any open, any compatible repository. It's not a problem. And it is initially a service to review preprints on a single blind review process but it has evolved as a toolbox to publish in open access. So this is the meaning of AP Sciences. It is above, above um, open access repositories. Um, this is a simple aspect of the workflow. Um, this is just a glance of the workflow. Um, everything starts with the preprints that has to be submitted in an open access repository, like Al Archive or Zinodo. Then the preprints, is uh, can be submitted to a journal only with the PID of the preprint, for instance, a DOI on Zenodo or the PID of archive. 
we can automatically, automatically retrieve the metadata of the preprint. And then the editor committee will handle the submission as usual for a journal by appointing referees, for instance, and requesting um, eventually some of our versions of the preprint that can be submitted again in the Panaccess repositories. In the end of the process, if the journal accepts the paper, it is published also in open access repositories. And it, if it is rejected, it, it will remain, of course, in the open access repository. <clears throat> so it's a sample result of uh, the publishing process. On the left, it is the versions uh, hosted by archive. And you can see on the bottom on the blue box that is, has received the journal references, the journal name and issue, for instance. On the right, this is the same paper that has been published in the journal. So the view from the journal, um, if you can see here, there is a button, download this file. If you click on this button, in fact, you will download the file on the archive. We do not host the papers that are hosted on archives. And also, if you want, you can click on consider article web page and you will be redirected to archive where we can see the different versions of this paper. Uh, this one, I guess, had 10 versions. So it has been submitted in 2018 and published in 2020. Um, so we believe so Episciences is a good solution uh, for reducing publishing costs because uh, there are no subscriptions, no APCs, and we do provide free hosting and support for the journals. We can publish at a reasonable cost because we are sharing our IT infrastructure with Al and ScienceConf. And also, the preservation and hosting of the file is done by repositories. It is a good way to reinvest uh, public money in public service because the time spent by researchers, for instance, and IT engin uh, engineers can be reinvested in uh, a public good for scientific dissemination. It is also a nice way to add value to open access repositories because we are encouraging preprint usage and the validation and certification of preprints that is not usually done by open archives. It is a good way to reduce time to access publication because everything is available from the preprint to the, pre to the published version in the repositories. You don't have to wait to see the preprints or the published version and everything is online, even if rejected by journals. Your preprint can be submitted to other journals if it is rejected. It can also increase traceability because uh, you can track the evolution of document versions, including after publication. In fact, you can consider publications as a conversation flow because behind the published version of record, uh, the authors can submit any new versions on the archive. And it is also a nice way to be compliant with open access mandates and fair principles because uh, everything is immediately accessible as open access and uh, we can rely on the fair principle compliance of repositories and ourselves. Also, a good aspect it does, it, that is that it allows authors to retain their rights because most of the journals are using Creative Commons licenses. It means that they do have a non-exclusive dis distribution right. And it is a good way to ensure long-term preservation and accessibility of content because you can maintain control over access to publication and evaluation. It is not dependent on the goodwill of a commercial publisher. And we can maintain access to content even if the journal ceases publication because we do not host the content. It can remain accessible in open access repositories, sorry, even if the journal disappears. It is also a good way to ensure scientific independence because it allows scientific communities to own their journals and the data created by their activity. You can also have a scientific publication policy independent of any commercial logic. And it's also um, a kind of way to, it's a good way to increase bibliodiversity. And uh, one more important point, I think, is that it avoids the work for tracking by publishers and the resales, uh, the resale of this data that is happening nowadays. Uh, let's take a look uh, first, just look at the next um, steps for our platform. Uh, we will uh, leverage the core notify initiative. In fact, the core, the core notify 
is a standard approach for peer review services on distributed resources contained in repositories, archives, preprint servers, and other data providers. For instance, here, it will allow researchers to submit their preprints on the R repository and then submit it at the same time to an EpiScience journal in a single step. Notification will be sent to EpiScience's journal to process the submission. After the peer review by the journal, if the article is accepted and published, the EpiScience's journal will send a notification to AL to be able to process the fact that uh, the, the preprint has been endorsed and published by the um, EpiScience journal. You should then be able to replicate the same kind of workflow for other repositories uh, with EpiSciences and with other peer review services with AL. Okay, sorry, a bit late. <laughs> Great, many thanks, uh, Rafael. Um, great presentation. Uh, so I see that there are already some comments here, questions here in the chat. So let's use chat to parallel discussion. Uh, data management plan require data travel log from uh, Cecilia Maschia. Uh, or Maschia, sorry. Maschia. Maschia, okay, yes. perfect. <laughs> no problem. Let's, let's proceed your presentation. Uh, thank you no. for the contribution to the, to the Open Science uh, Fair. Okay, hi, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Cecilia Maggia and I'm a researcher engineer at CRS4, which is a public multidisciplinary research center in Italy. And today I'm briefly present you the guide we have developed to support uh, the writing of data management plans uh, for research projects. First of all, a little bit of context uh, very quickly. As we probably all know, the data management plan is uh, the document that should uh, uh, outline all the strategy uh, for the data handling from the starting of the project to the end and beyond, uh, spanning uh, um, across many different uh, topics in relation to the uh, data man management. And uh, um, just like being a travel journal, it should uh, evolve every time new information is acquired or even when uh, something makes the project deviate from the initial uh, plan. Uh, as we heard uh, in these days, uh, there are uh, many uh, tools uh, and templates uh, available to help uh, researchers in uh, collecting the, uh, the ideas um, and to form a first draft of uh, the, uh, the data management plan. Most of these tools that are very helpful for them uh, are based on a predefined set of questions uh, that, and the answers are uh, then elaborated to form the output of the document. And then uh, the role of the data management plan curator should be to uh, critically elaborate uh, this output in order to, uh, to explore uh, and deepen all the various topics uh, and add uh, even further details uh, regarding the specificity of uh, the study. But uh, what often happens in, is that uh, the data management plan remains uh, uh, in this uh, uh, first initial form uh, without being further elaborated. And uh, uh, in this way, remaining in, in this uh, um, questionnaire-like format, uh, also sometimes, sometimes uh, with partially uh, filled uh, questions. Um, and uh, uh, the reason is that uh, um, create a good data management plan uh, could be a quite uh, complicated task. Uh, we can say that it takes a village, as I heard uh, yesterday from a presentation, in the sense that uh, um, uh, there are a large amount and variety of uh, knowledge required to, uh, to express all the details related to the data management. So we decided to develop a guide in order to help researchers to think of all uh, of a broader set of possible aspects in order to uh, improve and uh, go more in, in detail to um, the, um, in respect to all, all um, so to just uh, the things demanded by the templates and the tools. Um, to do so, we uh, oh sorry, we uh, analyzed uh, several templates between the, the most used ones, um, and uh, we developed uh, a guide that is currently published on Zenodo, and it is being tested. Um, 
under the IFER program, which is a regional initiative uh, to promote uh, the adoption of best practices for uh, the biomedical uh, research community in Sardinia. Um, so as I was saying, the, the structure of the guide um, uh, is basically what you are, uh, you are viewing. Uh, we collect uh, um, from this analysis uh, the most relevant features that should be considered uh, to have a good data management plan, and we articulated uh, those in these uh, five main dimensions. And for each uh, dimension, the guide gives uh, um, a motiv the motivation. Um, suggest some key points to be considered and uh, gives uh, also some practical tips and references when possible to uh, help researchers in the plan, especially for some rather technical aspects. Uh, also, the guide suggests which, uh, will, which are uh, the um, uh, most important aspects that shall be included in the plan to, to be fair, more fair. Uh, so, for example, for the documentation and metadata section uh, showed here, uh, the guide states that it is important to describe as much as possible details about the data and the metadata involved in the project uh, in order to make them uh, uh, reusable and, and understandable, uh, possibly by both humans and machines. So, touching uh, various things like uh, the format used, the standards, etc. Uh, also, the guide suggests to consult the directory of metadata standards in order to align the, um, uh, the ones used to the most commonly adopted in order to foster interoperability. Um, I'm sorry, this is it's blocked. Okay, sorry. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, um, the, uh, the, the peculiarities of the subject of the research must be taken into account always, because uh, uh, if you think of uh, dealing with sensitive or non-sensitive data, there can be uh, big differences in the, in the security measures adopted, in the permission for data handling, et cetera, because they respond to different uh, uh, risks, okay? So uh, in this case, I would like to cite uh, an example, uh, which is a borderline case in which uh, the donors of a biobank of genetic samples decided to uh, withdraw uh, their consent after the uh, biobank was sold for bankruptcy. So uh, such cases demonstrate how it is important to have uh, uh, a good and well done long term planning in order to uh, take into account all of these uh, uh, peculiarities and uh, basically protect the data. Uh, to, uh, uh, in this sense, the guide uh, stress uh, these aspects. In fact, you can find some similar uh, concept in uh, more than one section. And for example, the guide suggests also uh, to uh, some tips to uh, help researchers in deciding which uh, is the best uh, repository for the data, and also to uh, give a guide to how to, sh to, to decide which is the most appropriate appropriate license for uh, for the data sharing. Uh, okay, to sum up, um, we developed a guide that is uh, um, a collection of suggestions to, uh, to push uh, the uh, researchers to explore uh, many different uh, aspects in related to data uh, management and stewardship. Um, it, the guide starts from uh, a different approach in respect to the templates, but uh, uh, they are fully compatible. So it could be also useful to uh, review the output of the tools and to improve, uh, and to improve it. Um, we received uh, positive feedback from the studies participating in the IFR program, and currently uh, we are planning also systematic evaluations and future refinements. Thank you very much for listening. Great, uh, many thanks. If you... So Cecilia, a great presentation, many thanks to comply with the, and also with the, the time. Uh, so, um, Questions for this uh, pragmatic approach in this guide uh, to Cecilia can be you can put it in the chat and Cecilia can maybe also share some of the links uh, she mentioned in the chat. Um, Tom Mostert, now uh, introduction to open metadata in for use cases for open access books uh, is the presenter of um, of this presentation with other three out uh, so with a total of three authors so. Tom, you can present yourself and the, the other authors of this presentation. Okay, perfect. 
Yes, uh, thank you, Pedro. And uh, hello and, and welcome everyone. I am uh, Tom Moster. I am uh, here on behalf of the, the Copian project. And I'm also a community manager at the directory of open access books and OAPEN. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, Toad, uh, which is a, a new service developed as part of uh, the Copian project uh, and is an open metadata uh, platform. And specifically, I'll share a bit more about uh, four use cases that we currently see uh, for Toad uh, and specifically for open access books. So first I'll share a little bit more about the, the Copian project, which stands for the community-led open publication infrastructure for monographs and is generously funded by uh, Research England and Arcadia. And as you can see here, it's an international partnership of open access book publishers, uh, university and national libraries, infrastructure providers, universities, and membership organizations. And there are further collaborations with uh, many more parties here, such as uh, Open Air and uh, Opera, for instance. Um, in total, Copen consists of seven uh, work packages. Um, and for this presentation on Toad, we'll specifically look at two of these, Work Package 5, Building an Open Dissemination System, and Work Package 7. So what is Toad? Uh, Toad is an open metadata management and dissemination system. Um, it is developing the uh, technical protocols and infrastructure to better integrate open access books into institutional library, repository, discovery, and preservation systems. It is providing a metadata management service for open access book publishers, um, and it comes in the form of a, a catalog and a working wiki, working wiki, the links for which I'll share after the uh, presentation. Um, so here you can see uh, the what the catalog looks like when visiting it on toad.pub. Um, it basically lists all the publications uh, in there. Um, and you can see, you can read the, the books and access them there, and also retrieve the, the metadata for the books. Uh, so there are four use cases that we've identified thus far for Toad. The first being uh, the creation and management of metadata for publishers the repurposing of the publisher metadata, the dissemination of metadata records, and lastly, the tote as a seed for an open metadata ecology. So looking at the first use case, publisher creation and metadata management, um, I'll add that as you can see here, tote is uh, already in use by uh, five publishers, open book publishers, Punkton Books, uh, Mattering Press, Mison Press, and Media Studies Press. Um, they use Toad as a cloud-based database through which uh, they can create, update, and manage their open access books uh, records and their uh, metadata. Uh, all the metadata is openly licensed. It's a standards compliant bibliographic metadata, and it's specifically for open access books. So once the metadata is in Toad, what happens then? Um, what you can see here is from the publisher interface, how they can um, add uh, and manage a metadata record, for instance, for uh, one of their books. Um, they can update the records. Um, they can keep them here. Uh, as you'll see, there is room to enter metadata such as uh, DOIs, uh, OCLC numbers, and further references. And we're also working on a specific publisher service, which will allow publishers to submit through Toad um, information to Crossref, to register DOIs and to ORCID to register publications. And all of this happens, of course, under uh, CC0 open metadata licenses. And this allows for the second use case, which we've identified here, which is the repurposing of the publisher metadata. So publishers and other parties can pull selected data from Toad. Uh, and here are two examples of how this is being done uh, already. Uh, the first being uh, a specific uh, one of the publishers, open book publishers, uh, who is pulling metadata from Toad for managing uh, their own consumer facing website. Um, and Toad enables them to uh, keep information on the consumer facing website up to date by leveraging the Toad API. Uh, then the second being a platform uh, supporting collective library funding, which is uh, called the Open Book Collective. Uh, which will be pulling metadata from Toad for dynamic display 
of content, of book content, of various multi-publisher collections uh, via their platform to support collective library funding. And of course, um, not just publishers, but also other parties can make use uh, of the API and the metadata feeds. The third use case is the dissemination of metadata records. Um, what you can see here is that Toad also allows uh, publishers um, and third parties to take the Toad metadata in uh, different formats. Uh, and that allows Toad to be connected to uh, different third party services and uh, distribution channels, such as OAPEN, the Directory of Open Access Books, Project Muse, but also in future parties such as the Internet Archive or the Triple Project. Um, and as you can see here, this comes in uh, many different flavors. And in total, we've identified over 120 different uh, distribution uh, channels that might be relevant uh, to connect with. Um, so that what, what that will do uh, is that it will connect the publishers and their open access book publications um, through the API with uh, third party services or through the metadata outputs to other parties and distribution channels. Um, making use of the open metadata and uh, disseminating the open access books. Then the fourth use case um, is Toad as a potential open metadata ecology. Um, and this is really a, a question to, to all of you here and to anyone um, who might have ideas of, about how Toad could continue to serve these stakeholders through the uh, four identified use cases but also if there are any other use cases that you could imagine for open access books. So that could be um, uh, from uh, uh, for publishers, for instance, but also for libraries, other stakeholders, and specifically uh, bearing in mind open and fair data principles. Um, yeah, I think that, that was it for me. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, please feel free to share your thoughts uh, and ideas for, for Toad and questions in the in the chat. Great. Um, many thanks, Tom, uh, for this um, uh, great presentation. And uh, at the end, also asking contributions. Uh, so feel free to, to make these suggestions or comments to Tom in the, in the chat. Tom, maybe it's also interesting if you share some of the links in the chat. Uh, opening the Future now by Martin Eve. So let's see how Martin can open our future <laughs> and new collaborative library funding model for open access monographs. Thanks so, so much, Pedro, and uh, everyone else here today. Um, so I'm not gonna go into a huge explanation about the COPIN project, because I think Tom's done uh, a great job on that in the last presentation, but suffice it to say that I'm also part of the COPIN project, but working on something quite different within that space. So I don't think I need, um, in this particular audience demographic to talk too much about why open access matters. Obviously we're at the open science fair, but I do think it's worth saying that in the humanities disciplines, the idea of the book still holds a lot of currency. It is the primary means by which long form scholarship in the humanities and social scientific disciplines is disseminated. However, the economics of book publishing are very different to those of journal publication. Uh, the long form of the artifact means that we have much higher costs if you have a book processing charge model than an article processing charge model, for example. And so it's much harder often to get these longer form outputs into open access um, availability, and we face a different set of challenges. In the last year or so, there have been several attempts to work out how existing presses and born open access presses can sustain their enterprises in an open access environment. So I should say we sort of started with um, scholar led born open access presses like open book publishers and punctum books who launched membership schemes where the idea was that libraries would come along and um, pay an annual fee to those organizations so that they could make their outputs openly accessible. This again then means there is no book processing charge for an author to find. We've then had the launch of several very large scale and ambitious pilots from mega presses like MIT Press, who have a thing called Direct to Open, which is a subscription threshold membership model. And the idea there is that if they can get a certain number of library members to join every year, they will make the entire front list openly accessible. So there's a threshold, it is kind of all or nothing, but on the other hand, 
they could get the entire front list to be open access. Now, between those polls of the Born Open Access presses and, and the mega presses, though, there are hundreds and hundreds of small to medium sized university presses who are often mission aligned with universities, but who don't know what to do about open access at the moment. And my work package on the Copin project is designed to try to find models to transition those presses to enable them to make their outputs open access, preferably without article processing charges. So we are work package three of COPIM, uh, and we're working with the Central European University Press and Liverpool University Press to convert their models to friendly, open access, amenable mechanisms. So what have we come up with? So Opening the Future is a model that is for presses that have an existing backlist, and it combines together a membership and a subscription model. It dynamically scales, so we're not an all or nothing system. And the idea is that we want to create a system where the front list at these presses every year, so say in the case of Central European University Press, 25 titles are open access. And we're going to do that by selling subscriptions to their backlist of content. So how does that work? So our presses have put together packages of books, up to 50 books in a package. And libraries can choose which of those packages they want to subscribe to. Now, that's not open access content. That is giving the libraries something for their local collection only that they subscribe to and get as a rivalrous benefit. What's potentially clever about it is that we use the revenue from that subscription to the backlist to fund the front list to be openly accessible. And in that way, we don't have book processing charges. Um, there are questions people ask, well, if, if you're selling the backlist, you know, won't that run out eventually? We do give people perpetual access once they've been a member for three years. Um, in the case of the Central European University Press, though, we have enough titles to last up to 30 years on that. But what we really hope is that libraries that came along and subscribed just to get the backlist actually recognise that by funding the front list to be open for everyone, they do a much better service to the world and to scholarship and research. And so they come for the backlist, but stay for the open access front list. And in that way, we convert libraries that don't even have a dedicated open access budget to funding open access almost by stealth. The prices that we're charging are less than half an article processing charge at some of the larger for-profit publishers. Um, we have delivered via Project Muse for often for our um, op open access and subscription titles. And if we can hit our membership thresholds, we're looking at a price per library of just 11 euros per book. Now, for the record, if you buy an academic scholarly book um, at full price, you're normally looking at about 60 euros per book. And a book processing charge can be up to 15,000 euros or even more. So if we can get the price down by collective pricing to 11 euros per book per library, we're not only achieving open access, but we're saving library budgets while we're at it. And as more members join, the costs come down because it's a collective pooling model where we just need the funds centrally to fund the books we're publishing. Where if we can get past the 250 membership mark, we should in future years be able to lower prices that we charge to libraries. Just by way of, of introduction to the presses, we're working with the Central European University Press did an experiment during lockdown where they made some of their books open access. And they suddenly saw a rocket in the number of accesses. It really demonstrated that um, open access to books is something that people want and that there's a market for. Likewise, Liverpool University Press is a very well established press, um, publishing open access for more than 10 years itself, using different models with approximately 150 books per year. Um, the presses that are coming on board here are taking a substantial risk and venturing their future on an open access environment, which is great to see. But what I like most about this model, as I said, is the dynamic scaling. So we've just announced, or just about to announce, that we've reached the threshold for our fifth book. We don't have to get to 25 books at each press before we say, yes, 25 will be open access or zero will be open access. When we have the money, we make the titles openly accessible. And so the model grows as library members join. And as I said, we're delivering good value for money here. 
So that's where I'm going to stop. I think I'm in my seven minutes. Um, if you'd like to know more, we have a website at openingthefuture.net, um, which has all the information about the packages, the presses, and the model. Um, alternatively, you can also email me, whether you're a publisher, a library, or an interested academic. Um, I'm martin.eve at bbk.ac.uk. Um, thanks so much again for listening. I hope that was of interest, and I'll look forward to the next presentations. Great, really interesting. Many thanks for this um, the, the contribution for the conference. Uh, I think we will have for sure time for questions and feel free also to share some uh, some of the links you you shared in your presentation here and also in the chat. But I think it will be useful for all. So let's move from the, this um, open access uh, books and monographs uh, world to a national a national research information system uh, directly from Europe to Ecuador. So Ready Plus uh, by Freddy Sumba Orellana and Paulo Crespo. So uh, Freddy, uh, you can you can start. Okay, perfect. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, let me show the project that the name is Ready Plus, so our Ecuadorian research and information platform based in Greece. Uh, this is um, a project developed by CEDIA in Ecuador. Uh, let me show some numbers about the OECD government open data survey with uh, Inter-American Development Bank, so for in 2018. This show an interesting number uh, about how governments align to open data. For example, Ecuador is in the, in the last position. Uh, they have the, the number about 0 that 29 in all countries in Latin America. This show three different aspects. Uh, it's about data this, uh, available, data accessibility, and how the government reuse the data. Um, for example, this survey showed that 81% of the countries have a strategy for open data government. The 75% of the countries have a national plan and 50% of countries in Latin America have a policy. This number shows uh, an scenario that is, is not good for Latin American countries. This is the first reason uh, because the uh, ecosystem of academia and research work with, work in CEDIA to improve the development of open science in Latin America, and specifically in Ecuador. For example, uh, you can show some numbers of what is the study that CEDIA works in open science principles. For example, in 2000, 15, we implemented the, the project in RIDE, this is a national, uh, national network of open access repositories. And uh, with the project, the, La Referencia, we use Drive that zero um, to start. And in 2019, we established collaboration with Senesit. This is the, um, it's, it's a goal for us because we start the, provide the space support for different universities and start using the OpenAI 3.0 guidelines. And this is the reason because we, we start uh, working in the CRIS um, systems in Ecuador and with the National Research Observatory that it have different aspects because uh, it's necessary to consider different resources and actors in a CRIS ecosystem or CRIS a system platform. For example, we have different uh, tools to show bibliographic resource, data set, uh, research provides uh, offering and demand of technology, research events and, cong and Congress patents con with the intention to provide national metrics and indicators. This is the, the, the first well object. And in this presentation, you can see the academic, scientific, and technology information platform. The, the more important things in these cases articulate and make visible the scientific, academic, and technology production in the country. Uh, another benefit is to enhance the national network 
of open access repositories in the country, enable a national CRISP platform that, that it is interoperable with institutions, research and management systems, and provide a value add services based on data for supporting the decision making at institutional and government level. That is the more important things to make decision based on data, data in the country. Yeah. Um, in the in the core in the core components of the platform, uh, we can view the different the different models. For example, you can see the core components that is ready. Uh, Pablo, you can explain. Yeah. I, I can explain from now. Uh, we have uh, several uh, lines, working lines, like uh, for example, the 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 right is the uh, National Network of, of Open Access, as, as Freddy says before, uh, to uh, harvest all the information of academic production of, of universities. Uh, another line is uh, ready, is like uh, the semantic repository of uh, Ecuadorian researchers, uh, which uh, provides a, a, a powerful tool to, to, to get some uh, insights about um, all the, the production in, in, in researching areas, uh, common areas, uh, common areas uh, from research uh, between some researchers uh, helps to to identify common uh, lines of, of, of research. You know, uh, the next line is uh, providing uh, bibliographic resources to, to universities like Cielo, the space. Uh, between others, uh, which helps to improve uh, all the aim to 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 get <laughs> open science in, in Ecuador. Um, another line, uh, the, the the two last lines are uh, we are working right now uh, are projects that uh, will see the light in the few months. It's like uh, the first is the and institutional crisis uh, systems like we're working in pilots with two universities right now uh, to implement this space crisis on in vivo and the last uh, working line is uh, to to provide to universities a, a, a platform to get a, a national repository for for data for all all data sets all all the uh, information that we have or, or the universities have in, in production right now and so they, they can share with with, with other universities uh, in the first two, two uh, working lines uh, we have some uh, statistics about the, the the production academic production in Ecuador like uh, we have right now uh, 65 institutions uh, which is is more than in the the, the almost all the universities in, in, in Ecuador that uh, are integrated in this, this, this solution. No? The same with uh, the ready, the semantic repository. Uh, this help, uh, helps us to, to get uh, some uh, insights, some view of, about the, the production in between uh, researchers, yeah. And uh, we have uh, for last uh, some statistics about um, the production and the lines uh, be, be, uh, of uh, researching in, in Ecuador. And we have uh, this is somehow, uh, yes, 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 some trends about the, 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 the researching areas in, in, in Ecuador. So uh, these are uh, some uh, powerful. Um, indicators that provide information to decision makers uh, in, in academic, uh, government, and, and institutional uh, sectors. Yep. Thank you. That's all. Uh, Thank you. Uh, presentation. The prototype is in the chat. The URL is ready to learn that video that uh, do that come that is see and some questions we are Great, uh, many thanks, um, Freddy and uh, Pablo. Great presentation. Good to see these uh, relevant <laughs> developments in Ecuador. 
Let's move for, for re3.core.ref. Um, uh, Nina, uh, so you can start your presentation, this last presentation. Feel free to ask questions in the chat, to share links. Uh, we will have a few time at the end, but uh, uh, take uh, the opportunity also to exchange some information in the chat. So let's go, Nina. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can all see my presentation now. Perfect. Great. So uh, very welcome. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for joining today. Um, my name is Nina Weisweiler, and I work for the Helmholtz Open Science Office. And here I'm representing the Rethrow Data CARF project to provide you with uh, the latest updates on the Rethrow Data service and also on our project. Um, first, I would like to start with a very short introduction of the uh, registry of research data repositories, Rethrow Data. For those who don't know the service yet, it's a global registry of research data repositories that currently lists over 2,700 entries, which makes it the most comprehensive uh, registry in the world for data repositories. Um, the website went live in 2012 and has increased steadily over the years, uh, thanks to the reliable work of our editorial team. Refer data covers all academic disciplines and presents repositories for the permanent storage and access to research data for researchers, funding bodies, publishers, and scholarly institutions, as well as related infrastructures. It promotes a culture of sharing, better access, and increased visibility of research data, thereby also supporting the realization of the fair data principles. So if you're a data repository operator by chance, I would like to encourage you really to visit Refer data update existing entries or suggest any missing ones. Research Data started as a project funded by the German Research Foundation, DFG, involving the Humboldt University, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT, and the Helmholtz Open Science Office. In 2013, the service merged with DataBib, a similar registry that was located as at Purdue University in the US, and since 2015, it's a data site partner service chaired by the KIT and Purdue University. In 2020, the current project Refute Data CoreF started again with funding from the DFG. Before I go into more detail about the project, a few words about how the Refute Data metadata is created and maintained. So new repository entries can either be submitted by users via the suggest form on our website or they will be selected directly by our editorial team at KIT. Um, each new entry is checked and reviewed at least by two of our editors before publication to ensure the high quality of our metadata. After the record goes live, the metadata can be accessed through our web user interface or an API. Um, now let's have a look at our project work in Refute Data CoreF, which stands for Community Driven Open Reference for Research Data Repositories. Um, the main project goal is to further develop and enhance the Refer Data service to position Refer Data as the central reference for research data repositories. Um, and to reach this goal, we will update uh, and expand the metadata schema, which has already happened one time, develop further options for automated data exchange, build new widgets and API features, and develop additional functions to support monitoring and recommendation of repositories. These activities will be carried out in orientation um, on our recently published conceptual model. So here you can see again on the partners that are involved in the project, um, because the time is short, I will skip this slide, but you can always visit our blog to find uh, updates and new information. All right, then let's zoom in on our new model. Last year, we have conducted a survey and organized three workshop sessions with a group of relevant stakeholders. Our goal was to collect um, different use cases of Re3 data and identify potential service gaps. A detailed report of the survey and workshop results is available for download. You can see the link. I will post it in the chat later as well. And based on this preliminary work, um, the conceptual model for user stories was generated which will help our team to recalibrate review data according to current and future needs of the community. The model also describes the history, governance, and current technical infrastructure of review data. Um, the results of the report were consulted in restructuring the model's main section concerning target groups and user stories. Here you can see the most common use cases that we identified. First one is search and discovery of research data repositories. 
Um, so we have divided those in um, existing ones and those that we are working on as part of the CORREF pro pro uh, project for the future. Um, regarding the search and discovery users uh, come to re data currently to find appropriate repositories to deposit or look for data sets. And it is also used as a, um, as a tool for recommendation for data repositories, obviously. Um, in the future, these activities shall be supported by a new profile function, which enables the search via community-defined subsets of criteria, for example, to filter for fair enabling repositories. Regarding um, the reuse of re data metadata, there are many systems reusing the metadata, including, for example, the European Open Science Monitor or Open Air. Um, and data from re data is used to enrich those services uh, create lists of recommended repositories or to monitor the landscape of research infrastructures. Um, the planned profile function is intended to facilitate these applications too. Currently, um, users can propose changes to entries via the online suggest form, as I mentioned, to administrate data. But in addition, we want to enable authenticated users like repository operators or certification agencies like Quartus Seal to edit entries directly. This process shall be supported by the implementation of raw IDs for organization and ORCID for persons. And finally, re data is used for referencing research data repositories, for example, via the re data DOI. This can be used by researchers to indicate the location of their data, to increase the visibility of an organization running the repository, or to uniquely identify a repository for reference purposes, among others. And to um, basically to realize, to implement these future use cases, we have uh, published a new version of our metadata schema with these two uh, major changes uh, regarding the profile and the uh, certificate information. Um, and towards the end of the project, a second, even bigger revision will follow. And as I see that my time is uh, getting short here, I will actually skip the last slide. Um, you can just have a look at the presentation to find out more about our um, a survey on research data uh, quality assurance uh, measures by repository operators. Um, and with this, I would like to close my presentation. Thank you all very much for listening and hope that you gain some interesting new insights. So please get in touch if you have any further questions. Many thanks, Nina, many thanks. So you have the, the context. Um, uh, let's use now uh, some time to, to questions. I I know that there were already uh, four or five uh, questions in the chat that were replied. At least um, by Cecilia, by um, by Raphael. Uh, so, but feel free to put your questions to the to the presenters. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but we have questions. Time for two or three questions. Uh, if you have questions, just uh, turn on your microphone and, uh, and ask, or put it here in the chat. But feel free to do it. Uh, we had um, different tools addressing different issues, uh, which were great. Uh, so feel free. So um, also take the opportunity to copy the links, the useful links that are in the chat. Um, so. Um, Pedro, there's a question on, on Toad. Can I answer it? Please, um, please do. Yeah? I was... Okay. So I see there's a question in the chat from Gabriela. Uh, the question is uh, whether the metadata in Toad is also used in the Directory of oh, Open okay. Access Books, DOAB, or vice versa. Um, uh, it's a great question that I should be able to answer as I work for both. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think that to uh, try to explain it well is that, that Toad is the open metadata management system for publishers. And from there, they can distribute the metadata and their books to uh, various platforms, uh, one of which is indeed the directory of open access books. So uh, the publishers can, through Toad, all disseminate their metadata to the directory of open access books, but also to uh, many more uh, platforms. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Um, more questions. Also, Martin uh, shared here the link uh, for the, um, the the Python client. Uh, so you, it's useful information also. So I think I didn't miss. 
let's let's use just uh, these two minutes. Um, uh, Rafael uh, and Cecilia, do you want to, do you want to say something? Um, take the opportunity for a final remark. Uh, so, as you already provide some information in the chat, do you want to to say something? No. Any clarification? Uh, yes, just to just to add a small point that uh, if you would like to to candidate for a journal, we are open to to new journals, of course. So <laughs> feel free to contact us to to open a new journal. Thank you, and Cecilia. Uh, yes, I, I just can repeat what I was saying in the chat so that um, the guide is uh, something that is uh, evolving. Uh, it's a living document, uh, just uh, just like the DMP, the DMP and currently the, the version that is published uh, on Zenodo is the first usable and complete version, but um, I, I think that other uh, will come in future as soon as we receive the uh, other feedback. Okay, thank you. Martin or Tom, do you want to say something uh, also? So um, you want to um, ask something for the community to to contribute to the work, to the great work that you are doing or suggesting? Uh, Tom or Martin, do you want to? Tom, you already asked some questions, so, but uh, you want to highlight something at the end of this session? I, I suppose I'd just say that it's, it's good to see that books, which do play a role in, in so many disciplines that don't conventionally fall perhaps under the rhetoric of science, can, can get an airing here. And I think it's really important they don't get left behind at this point. We've seen great progress in the journal space and in the data space, we're seeing leaps ahead. Um, I'd really hate the disciplines that rely on that long form scholarship to not have the visibility of our colleagues in the natural sciences. So keeping that on the agenda seems to me a really valuable um activity so thank you for giving us that space to talk about yes, it today yes. quite important quite important um okay so for this national uh, this national project in ecuador and for the re3 data core f do you want to say something um fred and pablo thank you for sharing the great work that you are doing really uh, and challenging <laughs> you want to say something to finish uh, thank you, thank you, Pedro. Uh, it's important to show that a lot of Latin American countries uh, has the same intention to develop a national career system uh, to improve uh, collaboration network researchers to show the production of academic and research uh, publications to make uh, a national metrics and indicators that help to take decisions and. I am. We are grateful for the for the presentation uh, okay. of everyone. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Nina. To finish, any final remark? Do you need something from the community? Any request, specific request for us? Um, nothing specific because we have already received uh, a lot of community yes. feedback for the, the revision survey. of our metadata schema and also for the survey. We're really grateful. We have uh, three hundred. 30 um, repositories that uh, replied and we're not busy with the analysis. So of course we will uh, give that back uh, as soon as the analysis is um, finished and the results are there. Uh, we will publish those and make another workshop to disseminate the information. And um, yeah, so far, thank you to, for, for that. And um, yeah, okay. I am thankful for uh, being able to, to speak here. <laughs> okay, many thanks. So thank you all. Uh, I hope that it was useful. Uh, great, great presentations. I uh, enjoyed a lot. So let's move uh, to the other session because uh, they are ready uh, just to start the, the keynote. Okay. Um, technology plus engagement uh, equal to sustainable infrastructure. Let's let's hear that presentation. Many thanks. I will just give, leave the session open for some section, session, uh, seconds for you to copy some of the useful links here, and then we can we can close. So many thanks, many thanks for the presenters for the contribution to the conference. Okay, bye bye all. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. bye. Thanks.